um, so that they can engage socially. We, the big name for that is social skills, but that's what we mean by social and emotional development. Okay, so this is the context. This is what the, kind of the question for me for today's meeting was, how's technology impacting this? So I would say to you, if that's your only job is to take kids from where they are to a place of healthy development, how hard can that be, right? I mean, what makes that so difficult? Well, I think what we were just saying before is, what makes it difficult is that we're living in this cultural hurricane. Um, so many things have happened all at once. You know, we live in a completely global world right now, right? I mean, kids are aware. Think about when you grew up, your sense of awareness of the world. You know, I remember I grew up in Lincoln Park, Michigan, and I thought the world ended somewhere just beyond Goddard Road and Dix. You know, I mean, I knew, I knew a couple things in the world. It was Vietnam. That was a bummer. But, you know, I mean, for the most part, I didn't know much about I knew you could go to Florida, but it was pretty much, you know. So, but today's kids grow up with an absolute awareness of the whole world. They also have these wonderful things in their hands, right, that give them access to everything right now. This is a complete game changer. If you want to have some insight as to how crazy life is now, sometime when you're bored, go back and look about what life was like when the world shifted from the pre-modern times into modernity. If you remember back then, there was the printing press was invented. And because of the printing press, we had this extreme explosion of literacy and intelligence it gave birth to the scientific age. It gave birth to modernity. It gave birth to the Reformation because now everyone could read the Bible. Everyone could understand who God was. You didn't need the one educated person in the community, which the priest tended to be. So it completely changed the social structure. <coughs> what sociologists are saying is, and there's more to that, what, what, what sociologists are saying, that's what's happening right now. And, we're, and that's what I think is real important for us to get a handle on because we can't just say, well, what would my mom and dad do with an iPhone? Who knows? I don't, I don't know that they would have known what to do. So we have to make all this stuff up. So the main issue here is that we are connected. I call it digitized hyperconnection. Um, we, are, we are super connected in a really fast way with everything. This is a picture you may have seen from a few years ago from Facebook. Some intern at Facebook drew a graph of all the people who had friended all the people. This is all a graph of all the friends from five years ago on Facebook. That's not superimposed on a map. There's a line drawn. So essentially what that shows you is a map of the world. Basically, well, Europe and North and South America, there's no, the Soviet Union and China are not there because they're not connected. But you get the idea, right? So think of it this way, and I know you do, but I, this is the part where you get real gentle with yourself, okay? Like when you're not sure you're doing it right, this is the thing to remember. Do you remember growing up, and maybe for you, you had computers that look around, you're younger than me, suddenly feeling old. Um, but I can just tell you this, when I grew up, and it wasn't that long ago, um, we had like two rotary phones, do you guys remember <coughs> rotary phones? And it had like a 50 foot cord, and so, you know, the only way you could get privacy with that thing was to like, go like, and find, and you know, I had six older sisters, and so, you know, they would like take it, and they'd go up and down, and they'd be like in the, we had the closet, and they would go like, in the closet, well, you know, as a little kid, you could just follow the, the cord and sit outside and hear everything you needed to know about what the hell they were feeling about their boyfriend at any given time. And then we also had the one TV, right? And then the knob oh broke God. off, so you needed pliers to turn the channel. I don't know what that was about, but every TV was like that way. So think of how different that is. Just think for a moment about the ability of parents to control the influence of their kids when you have those two things. You know who's calling. You know why they're calling. There's no caller ID, so everyone picks up the phone. And if you were like me, um, when my sister Mary Ellen was dating Greg, and I didn't like Greg, um, and Greg called, I said, oh, Steve, is this you? I knew it was Greg, I knew it was Steve, and they actually broke up, they were engaged and they broke up. Um, isn't that terrible? It was a good move, though. I think she's good. <laughs> um, but, but think of, I mean, you had all that input, and you knew about social relationships, you knew about te how the, the world of the entertainment world was getting into your house. I mean, every, you, could, you couldn't watch stuff. I mean, there was those great nights when, my parents would go to a wedding, and they would never take me. You know, they, they, no one would ever invite all seven kids, and so I was, so I would get to watch whatever <coughs> I want on TV. That was like heaven for me. But you know, the worst thing I'd watch is like PT one hundred and nine, right? The, five channels. Yeah, five channels exactly. Okay, so we know that not only that quickly went from one TV in the house to a TV in every room to a TV in every office or a screen in every office. Till now, we have a screen in every pocket, right? So what does it mean that this thing right here can get more of the entertainment world, more communication with people that no one else knows about? I mean, that, this, is, this is why people just sit back and like 
drink and reach for the remote control and watch TV because it's just too much to process. It's too much. But not for us. That's why we're here. Now, this isn't all bad. Some of you, some, you may know some of this, but um, there's a lot of really cool places online, right? I mean, there's a, not only can, if I wanted to, could I real quickly get some real nasty porn on here. I might need a little help, but I could, eventually I could find it on here. But I can also go to a place like the Khan Academy. When my oldest daughter was in high school and struggling with um, her pre calc I would go to the Khan Academy. Best teachers in the world give lectures on these topics. I would learn it, and then I could show it to her. And then we, so in the same way that this is trouble, it's also doing great things. In fact, edX, I don't know if you've heard of this through Harvard, they are now making graduate level classes available for free to people around the world. This is a real game changer, that now anyone has access to an education. I mean, you might not be able to pay for the degree, but you know, India, China, wherever, poor people are now able to get the education that used to be reserved for us. And if you're a, I don't know if you're a Stephen Colbert fan, there you go. You ought to look up the, um, this edX and Stephen Colbert, because he made a big joke about it, like, but wait a minute. Education's for the wealthy. We shouldn't be allowing those poor people to get our education. He was just joking. It was, it was funny. I guess you would have had to see Stephen Colbert. Okay, so what goes with all this? I think we know this. You all implied this. For the first time in Western civilization, as parents, we are not able to monitor what's going on with our kids. You know, that all this just happened. You know, 30 years ago, you could monitor the TV. You could monitor who they hung out with for the most part, right? You could monitor um, now. I mean, do you ever have that experience through texting? I mean, I'm doing this all the time. My kids think I have obsessive compulsive disorder. It's like, who are you texting? Who are you texting? Who are you texting? You know? I mean, I drive them crazy because I just, it bugs me that I can't know. Is that, do you ever feel that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I know I'm crazy, but. Um, one of the big things that I found, this is a book that really helped me about three years ago. So if, I've, if you've heard me speak, you've probably heard me mention this because I mention it all the time. It's a great book called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Liu. He asks this question. He says, when you were growing up, where did you most like to play with your friends? Where you, if you can remember, when you could just wander and go anywhere, where would you go? I went to the woods. To the woods? Yeah. You'd find, he called it, we'd always find the edge of civilization. You know, we would go to the creek down in Lincoln Park. You know, the creek where you catch crayfish and, you know, or the field and catch butterflies. I mean, there's a te natural tendency in us as mammals, as humans, to get out in nature. You notice when you go on vacation, what is that when you go up north and go for a long walk or hang out at the beach or hang, spend time on a boat? What happens? It's good, right? Whatever it is, it's really good for the soul. Now what happened about 30, 40 years ago is we started having these planned communities, right? Where rather than having these edges of civilization where you would go climb trees and make stuff up and break your arm and do all these things where you learn the rules of nature, now what we do is we create this beautiful playground and we put you know, mulch in there about you know, 36 inches deep so that you can fall from 20 feet and just bounce and you're fine. <laughs> it's a very unnatural thing. And what he says is the more you remove kids from nature, the more problems they have. In fact, interventions for kids with ADHD, depression, and anxiety, when you move them back into nature, you just get them more time in the woods, more time playing, these kids' nervous systems get back in sync. There's something about our culture um, that is doing bad things to the nervous systems of kids. But he also says, um, you know, kids, because this is so darn interesting, kids don't want to go outside like they used to, even just to go outside and walk and play and shoot baskets, right? Anyone find that with their kids? Oh, yeah. so, so he says this is a big, this is one of the things that comes with this hyper uh, connection. Um, the other thing we just can't get away from is kids are being exposed to all kinds of traumatic things. You know, I don't know about you, we went to see friends in Chicago recently and they're watching YouTube videos downstairs. I come down before I go to bed. What YouTube videos are they watching? Like violent accidents, you know, fails where kid, people are thrown 20 feet and bounce off the roof. Oh, isn't that funny? That's traumatic for the brain, and it has impact um, on the brain. There's also a lot of sexual stuff. We know that, um, that TV is more and more sexually eroticized. We, we know that. Uh, we also know that um, more than half of teens um, have looked at porn, and if you give them a smartphone without any blocks on their smartphone, this is the, this is the medium of choice for kids to look at porn now. Again, so many computers are, are, are um, being monitored, and smartphones are much harder to monitor, so. Um, yes? Also, they have a like my kids will watch all these horror movies that yes. I can't even watch because I couldn't sleep and they're like, eh, you know, like it's like they they're tolerant to horrible things too. 
Yeah, well, and that's the question. What is that doing to their brains? Because mm -hmm. the human brain is not designed to watch people get you know, critically injured. It's supposed to have trauma. We're supposed to need, that's, that keeps us sensitive to human relationships. And I think that's a great observation. And, um, so we also know that this whole slide just basically <laughs> says that, and by the way, exposure to sexual events, we live in a culture that says, come on, it's just sex, it's no big deal, it's just a human function, you're overthinking it, you're overdoing it. The actual reality is, when you view this stuff on the internet, it changes the way attitudes towards sexuality. It makes people uh, more uncertain about their own sexuality, um, it increases favorable attitudes towards uncommitted sexual exploration, and it is connected to feeling lonely and depressed. And one of the things that is not for today, it's for another day, is the whole world of homosexuality and what's happening with kids who are watching homosexual porn when they're young and then growing up and getting confused feelings about the fact that that looks pleasurable and what that might mean for their identity. You know, I often say the way we grew up, we grew up with a completely intolerant, you know, critical, awful society when it came to people with a homosexual orientation. We were mean, we were cruel. We got away with using bad language towards them, and it was awful. One of the things that came out of that is we pressured people toward heterosexual behavior. Um, we don't have that anymore, and I think the jury's out into how that's gonna affect the emotional and social development of our kids, how that's gonna affect their sense of gender and sexuality and orientation. Um, it's not clear that this permissive culture is not going to create a lot more kids who believe that they might have homosexual orientation. Um, that won't get me. And I, you've probably seen this before, positive proof of global warming. <laughs> you can see that. <laughs> All right. Um, this is what someone mentioned before. There is a lot more impersonal, anonymous relating. Um, I don't know if you've had this. My kids have experienced this, where someone picks up their phone and starts texting people, pretending it's them, um, just for fun, just that's the new way people tease. We know that people go online and create alternative personalities just to toy with people. You know, they um, create, they pretend they're someone that they're not. We've all had, um, you know, we've heard about that in the news, but. So all this goes with um, this hyper connection. It says on the internet, no one knows your dog. Uh, you're a dog. Yeah. Okay, just uh, one last one. The last thing that happens is our kids, and this is a big one for us as parents, and I think this is one of the big battles we have as parents. Kids have access to more experts, and so David Kinnaman says, given their access to all kinds of information and a wide variety of worldviews, <coughs> many young adults no longer believe that the local church and Christianity provide the only or even best avenues to spiritual growth and maturation. They are able to get spiritual input from a variety of sources, unmediated by the delivery systems common to the established church. When I read this, this helped me understand a lot of the clients I work with. You know, the, the, the reality here is, even though I'm here and I'm speaking to you, and this is the way we've always done things, we have speakers come to churches and give you information, the truth is, you could have stayed home and Googled tweens, technology, emotional, social development, and Christianity, and it wouldn't have been nearly as good or fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you could have got a lot of this information in a way that you never could have done you know, just 15 or 20 years ago. So, so think of our kids. How many times has this happened with, with your kids where you realize they think they know more than you? I know this happens all the time. Kids come to me, you know, I see a lot of young people who are struggling with their sexual orientation or identity. And they'll come in and I'm not the first person they talk with. I mean, I'm not gonna brag, but I'd be a good first person to talk with about that because I understand a lot about sexual development and, and emotional development. I understand the, the Christian faith and how Jesus loves us and all that. But by the time they come in, they've been to three or four websites, usually really you know, gay embracing websites, and they've been given this whole way of thinking about it. So now, they've already had, they've already been filled up with experts. Now they're sitting in front of me and they feel like they have a way of seeing this. And now they're testing me based on the website that they don't even know how miserable the person is that created that website. They just know it looks really good. Does that make sense? So our kids have all these other experts so they don't feel like they need us as much. I mean, I, when I, used, I do evaluations and 20 years ago when I started doing this, I used to do a lot of ADHD evals. And parents would come in with their kids and they would be pretty much like, here's what we're seeing, what do we do? And I would go through the whole process. 10 years, starting 10 years ago, parents would come in and they would, with a pile of stuff from the internet, and they would say, well, he has ADHD because he does this, 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 and this. And as we read on this website, it's this, this, and they would have the answer. So we just